Oh, well, hello there, and welcome to Ask Ed number six. This is for the month of May 2022. It's connected to my podcast on the Mesoamerican ball game. Um, I got five questions this time, and that's pretty good. So we're going to get to them here in just a second. Uh, when I'm done with this, I will talk a little bit about the wrap-up of Ask Ed Season 3 and uh, what we're going to do for Archeo Ed Season 4. So, here we go. Okay, question number one is from Phantom Neutrino, and he asks, How were LGBTQ people treated in Maya society? It's a good question, and I had never actually looked into that. So I did a little bit, and here's the answer. Okay, well, I wish we had more information on this topic. Uh, I looked around a good bit, and frankly, what I found was mostly uh, Spanish opinions about it, and I really don't trust their biased opinions of how the Maya felt about it. Of course, uh, Spanish priests were pretty down on homosexuality, so uh, that was an issue. Um, there are definitely things that uh, are said about the Mayad contact. There's a lot of talk about how ritual and uh, male homosexuality were connected. There's talk about young men saving themselves for procreational sex during marriage and that they were sometimes given young men to have sexual relations with until they found the woman that they were going to marry. Uh, a lot of that just seems to me like hearsay, and uh, it's, it's not very reliable. I mean, that might have been the case. That was what was written down, but I don't trust the Spanish on a lot of the things that they thought that the Maya were doing at contact. Now, I would think a more productive route would be to look at ancient Maya art and look for any evidence of homosexuality there. Um, or uh, transvestites or anything like that. And there's really actually very, very little. Now there's a bunch of men dressed up as the corn god and it's a skirt. No, oh, well, I mean, that's those are clothes. That's not necessarily saying that they are uh, dressing as females. In fact, we'd have to say the corn god was doing that as well. Um, there is one single image that I have seen, and it's from a cave wall, uh, Natunich cave, and there is a picture clearly of two men very close together, and, uh, there's a, there's a penis connecting the two, so that may be homosexuality, uh, maybe, um, uh, maybe that's where they get it connected to ritual. I know that talking to modern Maya people, there's kind of a gender fluidity, especially among day keepers. They kind of feel like we all have male and female parts, and uh, they talk about the, uh, the powers that be being the mom that is the grandfather slash grandmother spirit. So in that regard, we have some evidence of gender fluidity. But the bottom line is, and I'm sorry to say it, that we don't know very much at all about how the ancient Maya felt about homosexuality or those issues around there. Uh, I will say generally, I, I think that it's absurd to think that any culture didn't have that because it's a, a natural part of uh, our natural world. Uh, animals are also sometimes homosexual. It's, it's a thing. But will we ever figure out what the ancient Maya thought about it? Mm, no. I could go on longer about the uh, hearsay about the Aztecs, but I won't. There's not much. Sorry. Question number two is from Larry. And Larry asks, Do the descriptions of ball games in the hieroglyphic record generally indicate who won? Or is the point simply that the game was played or that a specific ruler participated? Well, it's a good question. Let's get to it. Okay, so, you know, what do hieroglyphs say about the ball game? Are there winners and losers and such? Well, you know, there are thousands and thousands of Maya texts available at this point, and I can't say with any surety that I 
know the entire corpus and that it's not there somewhere, but to my knowledge, there is really very little said about the actual function of the game. That's one of the reasons we don't know the rules and uh, how many points would be scored and such as that. So, uh, you know, there's a few little places where we see some things, like there's a great pot that shows uh, ball players and who looks to be a ref and other people that look to be... Uh, participants or people watching rather um but i have never seen anything about uh winners and losers of course we have the popol vu and there are images that definitely show uh royalty mostly kings uh who are defeating someone or making a decisive play in the game it certainly makes it look like they are great at the game which is not surprising at all but in terms of uh, winners and losers, uh, you know, there's really nothing said about it. I mean, uh, Khan Balam, his boy name was Ah Pizal, which is ball player, which implies that the Royals are playing the game. But ah, uh, gosh, you know, I'm I'm batting pretty lame on this ask Ed. I I also for this one really can't say that there's any information about that. It does seem that they want to show us the game is being played, but the uh, the outcome seems to be not something worthy of inscribing in texts. Question number three is from William, and William broadly asks, My question would be an open-ended one on the ethics of dealing with indigenous communities with whom you disagree. I think it's fascinating that you have to play politician often in archaeology in the Americas. Some of the uh, examples he gave, to paraphrase them, were uh, the Kennewick man genetic controversy, modern Peruvian moche believing their ancestors drank blood, Sipan locals believing that the graves of their ancestors are theirs to loot, Modern nations gatekeeping access to the archaeological sites on their lands that they may not be related to. All right, well, this is a sticky question, and really, I think, one that's uh, philosophical as much as practical, but let's talk about it. Okay, so, yeah, you're right. Uh, there are a lot of politics involved in archaeology. Uh, there are definitely things to negotiate with indigenous folks and more uh, to negotiate amongst ourselves, our opinions and actions and, of course, our theories. But your question is really about how to uh, deal with indigenous folks that I don't necessarily agree with. Well... I mean, first and foremost, I like to practice uh, the golden rule. I like to uh, treat others as I would want to be treated in their place. And in the case of indigenous people, and especially what to do with the evidence of their ancestors, I staunchly think that it's their opinion. If they are around and they have an opinion, we should respect it, especially if it's on their land. Now, you know, we can debate whether or not they're actually connected to people on their land, like your last example, but, I mean, that in and of itself is rather uh, rude when it comes to their own land and their own opinion. You don't just say, well, I disagree with you. That doesn't seem to be your grandfather, so I think I have the right to dig it up. Uh, you know, in terms of looting, that is a darn shame when they do that, and I think that there needs to be a lot of awareness and pride, but um, you know, those are issues that keep things from being looted. But in the end, it is their ancestry, not mine, not yours, and if they choose to desecrate it, well, that is their business. And so, you know, I don't like to see anybody... Uh, tear up these sites to to get the things to loot out of there and sell but you know they're marginalized populations marginalized by western civilization so if they are down to the point where they want to sell their great great grandfather's pot so that their kid can eat well i think that's their right certainly if somebody came onto my property and i was busy digging up uh our cemetery they could be grossed out they could disapprove but uh i i would be outraged if they thought they had anything to say about it and i think that that's how we should uh 
uh, treat the things that the uh, indigenous folks are doing with their own patrimony. So, uh, you know, then the other aspect that you brought up, which is uh, not exactly the first part of your question, but, you know, how do I deal with folks that uh, have bought hook, line, and sinker, what I consider erroneous information given by archaeologists or historians or things? Well, that's, that's a tricky issue, too. I mean, uh, I am actually not disagreeing with them. I'm disagreeing with the person who told them that. And so, I, you know, I feel like that's fair game. If somebody from my uh, field told them something I disagree with, well, then, yeah, I feel uh, almost obligated to uh, at least forward my opinion. I probably would do what I normally do and say, like, you know, look, that's his opinion. This is my opinion. We both have uh, degrees from American universities. Um, you know, here are the facts. And uh, why don't you think about, from both your cultural perspective and logic, which one makes more sense to you and go with it? So, you know, that's a, that's another huge issue of this, too. You know, the real politics is the weird thing that guys like me are representing who these cultures were in ancient times. And uh, we're doing it, you know, oftentimes with no uh, cultural point of view uh, that's anywhere near what we're uh, trying to interpret these ancient cultures. So... Uh, you know, I try to step lightly there. I mean, I don't want to say something as uh, outrageous as you drank blood without 100% surety that that's what happened. It's a tricky issue, and I could go on like this forever, and maybe we'll do a follow-up. But, uh, you know, bottom line is, I believe that uh, it's their ancestors. Their opinions should be respected even when I disagree with them. Question number four is from Jen, and Jen asks, Has archaeology found any social stratification elements related to who could play the game or when? For example, uh, common man versus royalty, slaves, did women play? Well, this is uh, all interesting uh, thoughts and questions. Let's talk about it. Okay, who can play the Maya ball game? Well, uh, again, there's so many things we don't know, and I am sure that if uh, the ancient Maya could listen to all the things we think, they would gut laugh about how wrong we are. But based on the images that we have at our disposal from ancient times, I would say that it's really only the elites who get to play and uh, exclusively men. Uh, what we see is, you know, people dressed in fancy costumes and... Uh, People uh, treating them as important. Never seen a single woman even touching a ball in anything in the ancient times. So I don't think that women got to play back then. Ulama today in Sinaloa, there's a specific game for women, but it's certainly not mixed gender. Slaves would never be able to play. Um, they're just, you know, it's an elite and important activity. And I guess on a level that makes sense if we believe that what they think they're doing on some level is uh, imitating the actions of the hero twins from their creation story. Well, only important guys would be able to do that, right? Now, we may never know what happened in the back alleys of ancient Maya cities. It's entirely possible that slaves were playing on the sly, that women were playing. Uh, there, you know, there could have been some sort of Mulan thing going on, who knows? I mean, that's for our imagination. Uh, we have a very limited amount of data that is skewed from the people who commissioned it, which are the rich folks. So, you know, as far as we know, it's elite men who get to play. That could be wrong, but that's what uh, the information at our disposal tells us. And our final and fifth question comes from David. David asks, It's interesting that you were successful with making a ball by combining rubber latex and morning glory juice. Did you experiment with the amount of morning glory juice? All right. This one's an easy one for me. Here we go. So, how much morning glory juice did I need to use? Well, um, 
not very much at all. Uh, I learned that uh, I could put just a couple little drops in there and make it coagulate. And uh, I never really experimented with putting a whole lot in there. I, I put as little as I could and, uh, and the reaction happened. I never really uh, even thought about asking what would happen if I put more of it in there. I mean, it was congelling. What would happen is it, it would be a liquid, the latex would. I'd drop a couple drops of my uh, morning glory juice in it and stir it. And within under a minute, it would congel. The whole thing would congel into a kind of a silly putty. And then I'd have about one more minute at max to shape it into something and then it would harden up and be that shape again. So if I made it a patty, it would stay a patty. I couldn't go back to it 10 minutes later and squish it into a ball. Once it congelled and that action started because the morning glory juice got involved, uh, I had a little time to create the shape and then it set. Um, you know, probably one of the reasons I did not ever play with quantity very much is because I had very little morning glory juice. It turns out that it's really, really hard to squish juice out of morning glory vines. It wasn't the flowers, it was the vines themselves. And they're thin and they're in the hot sun all day, so they really didn't have much juice at all. And I collected tons of it and I'd squeeze it with all of my strength in my garlic press and I really didn't get any more than a shot glass out of it the entire time I was squeezing for hours and hours. And I ruined my garlic press so I couldn't keep squeezing. So uh, this is a fascinating question. I wonder what would have happened, but I only had what I had and I used very, very little. And it was interesting that just a few drops would take basically a shot glass of latex and turn it into rubber. Okay, so that's a wrap for Ask Ed number six and a wrap on season three of Archeo Ed. I don't think I'm going to keep doing this Ask Ed thing. I think I'm going to transform it next season into something that's uh, more general. I certainly will answer questions uh, as part of what this new thing is going to be, but it's also going to be something more like... Uh, Something like the, the rest of the story or something compared. It's going to be connected to the podcast, but it'll be more information directed to that podcast. Uh, I've enjoyed making these uh, Ask Ed things, but, uh, you know, I think that they are sometimes an imposition on people. I was trying to give you folks something that... Uh, that allowed you to participate in a more real way, but I ended up putting pressure on certain people. I don't mean to pressure anybody, and I ended up saying, you know, oh, nobody asked me any questions, like it was uh, sad or something. That's not what I intended either. That's It's going the wrong direction. So I'm going to transform it somehow. It's not going to go away. You're still going to get a bonus uh, for being part of this Patreon thing, which I very much appreciate. Uh, but it's going to change. It's going to change. And, of course, uh, I'm going to take the summer off. I will put certain things here and there. I'll still be in contact, but season four of Archeo Ed will start in September. This summer, I am going to try to improve. This has been exciting. I've now got 70 folks on Patreon. That's great. And uh, at the closing of season three here, we have now gotten over 38,000 downloads. That's not nothing. I'm certainly not a uh, influencer by any stretch, but uh, there's a growing amount of people, and I'm excited about this. I'm going to uh, improve, and uh, over this summer, I am going to learn, I'm going to hone my skills, and I'm going to invest in Archeo Ed. All this money that y'all have been sending through Patreon... I have kept most of it in an account, and I am now ready to actually start investing that in advertising. I'm going to enter the podcast in a few more contests, and I am going to pay for targeted advertising, and I hope that season four is going to start off with a bang. 
Now, uh, one more thing I'll say is that I know it's hard to uh, validate keeping with me on Patreon for months during the summer while I'm not starting again until September, but please do. Those of you who stick with me, I am going to make some of the first ArcheoEd merch. I'm going to make t-shirts or notebooks or something. I'm not quite sure yet, but here's a little sneak preview. I paid some folks on Fiverr to make me some new logos that I think are cool. Here's one right here, and here's one right here. Those are both pretty cool logos, and I'm looking forward to incorporate them and share them with you. I think more than anything, y'all just want to be part of my archaeology journal journey, and I'm going to try to find new ways to do that. So I will wrap up this overly long video explanation right here and wish you all a great summer. Thanks a lot. I'll talk to you soon.